and I saw a team of young people working, led by Fyodor Alexeyevich Sherbakov. But all of this was done remarkably clearly and quickly. In addition, they were also responsible for ensuring that the evacuation is carried out without panic, any access that would affect normal work. And they managed to do this. I do not know how they made it happen. I still cannot imagine because I only know the result of this work. The direct opposite of the work of this group was the work of the civil defense group in a composition they operated in the initial days. General Ivanov, who initially commanded this enterprise, in my opinion, simply failed. They did not know what to do, and even if they received direct instructions, they did not demonstrate any influence, management skill, or any ability to remedy this situation. I really doubt that these are only my personal impressions. This is how many felt, so to say in a subtle way, that the work of the KGB agents though not conspicuous, was positive, whereas the negative helpless part of the work of the civil defense was noticed in the early days of these events. I could not leave that unmentioned. During the first days of the Chernobyl tragedy, the flaws in our information service were very obvious. Even though we have Atomo Energomash, formerly called Atomizda, medical publishing houses the Knowledge Society. It turned out that the prepared literature that could be quickly distributed among the people to explain what doses are extremely dangerous for humans, how to behave when a person is inside a zone of increased radiation danger, a system that could be correctly advised on what to measure, how to measure, how to treat fruits and vegetables, the surface of which could be contaminated with beta gamma, alpha radiation, all this literature was totally absent. There were many books for experts, very thick, accurate, well written. These were stored in the libraries. But it was precisely such brochures, leaflets, same as the Japanese, shipped with their products, such as watches, voice recorders, video recorders, that were needed in those conditions which button to press, how long to wait, what to do. Almost no such literature was available in the country. I have already mentioned that I had proposed from the beginning to create a press group under the government commission that would correctly inform the population about the events that were happening and which would give the right advice. For some reason, this was not accepted. After Rishkov and Ligachev arrived at the disaster zone, Journalists were allowed in, and a large army of journalists appeared. But you know, it is hard to say even now. It was good that it was allowed, but it was bad, because it was not organized properly. Why? The journalists arrived, a variety of them, most of them very good journalists. For example, the team from Pravda, and the famous head of science department, Gubarev or Dinets. Many good Ukrainian journalists and documentary filmmakers appeared. But I saw myself how they ran up to the most famous people who were there, pressed the record button, and privately interviewed them on some specific issues. Sometimes they managed to ask the chairman of the government commission or one of the members of the commission about some particular specific topic. They, of course, spent most of their time on the field. They talked to the people that were evacuated, or with the people that worked on the third block, on decontamination, and this information was broadcasted. What they collected, what was published, of course, and it is of tremendous importance from a historical and archival point of view, as live documentary material, and this is necessary and essential, but at the same time, because the information was presented, from a particular specific point of view each time, the country did not get a daily or maybe at least weekly complete picture because the information came out in separate stages. The miners were working heroically 
but there was no information about the level of radioactivity they worked in, what was happening in the breast region nearby, who measures the radiation, and how. And so, together with a lot of very accurate descriptions and comments, there were also a lot of inaccuracies. For example, the press spent a lot of time on the so-called needle matter, which was tinkered with for a long time. The needle was an integral device that had to be placed into the belly of the erect fourth block and would have provided continuous information about the temperature inside, about the radiation fields and some other parameters. But in practice, even though the effort to put this needle in the right place from a helicopter was huge, there was nearly no information received from it. There was almost zero information. It only confirmed what had been obtained by other simpler and more reliable methods. So this episode of installing the needle was described very elaborately and very, so to say, extensively. At the same time, the enormous amount of work done by the dosimetrists, the humble work of the young people from the Khrushchev Institute, led by Shikalov, or Borov, or Vasiliev, the work of the Ryanovskaya, group led by Petrov, the work of Kombanov, who was there many times to test these dust suppression solutions, the efforts of all this work, the analysis of the projects that were undertaken, all of these weren't described properly. And also, mainly the chronology of these events themselves was not presented accurately. Naturally, many people overheard things here and there, and this led to exaggerated rumors, naturally about the number of people affected by radiation sickness, about the levels of contamination in Kiev, and the extent of the affected area. Any pause in a subsequent construction of the sarcophagus was frequently taken as some sort of catastrophe, as a collapse of some structure, as the appearance of the new emissions, or as a proof that the tractor is suddenly working again, and so forth. So no proper systematic information was provided on these questions. And this, of course, gave rise to all sorts of wrong and fearful depictions. For several months, the state of emissions from the fourth block was debated, even in a scientific community. The fact is that experts, those working directly at the station, experts from hydrometeorology service, had precisely measured the fallout dynamics. The first, the most powerful emission, was the one that threw millions of curries of radioactivity in the form of noble gases and iodine at high altitude. And those emissions were registered by almost all the countries in the world. Afterwards, there were a few days of active emission of radioactive particles, fuel, mainly due to the graphite burning. Then the emissions of these fuel particles ceased around the 2nd of May. Then the fuel began to heat up due to a layer of debris that accumulated and there was a release of already separated particles such as cesium, strontium, and then they spread until the 20th and 22nd of May. But already from the 3rd and 4th of May, there was a constant decrease in the total radioactivity emitted from the 4th block. However, because of the radioactivity that had been thrown away in the initial days, a large number of vehicles were spreading it on their wheels across various areas. Dust transfer, caused by the dry summer, was also increasing the contaminated areas. All of these was incorrectly attributed to the idea that the reactor is active and continues to emit increasing amounts of radioactivity. This created, so to say, a stressful environment for those who were working there, who are doing the decontamination. While the false presumptions that higher levels of radiations was being emitted from the fourth block, all kinds of redundant projects kept appearing like creating sort of a tube over the fourth block. I fought against the project from May. It was an absolutely useless project.
Nevertheless, various organizations were doing such work, creating such projects for an external shell that, if installed, would only complicate its subsequent work on the construction of the shelter, but will not have any effect on the release of aerosol radiation. But these talks that the reactor is smoldering, emitting a radioactivity in considerable amounts, were so strong that orders were given to manufacture various types of covers for it. They were designed, tested, but the matter ended when one of the last such constructions immediately crashed down while it was being lifted by a helicopter for testing and was completely destroyed. This put an end to such projects. These projects were devised under the influence of rumors, inaccurate information, and attempts were made to implement them. God forbid had any of them been implemented, they would only have complicated the future work. I remember how during the war there were two types of daily communications which were published in our newspapers or task reports. One where we recaptured German occupied points, where we retreated, where we took a large number of prisoners, where we suffered a partial defeat. This was precise official communication, which provided an account of the joyous and bitter developments on the front lines. That was accurate task information, but along with it there was a second type of communication, which comprised of many journalistic articles about specific battles, about specific people, about heroes on the home front, and so forth. So, at Chernobyl, our press reported a lot of information of the second type, about people, about their impressions, about what was happening there, but reported very little about what has happened so far, and what has changed. This, in my opinion, was a flaw in the communication system. Firstly, and secondly, there was too few statements by the expert scientists. I recall perhaps only one statement by Professor Ivanov from Moscow Engineering Physics Institute. A large article was published where he tried to simply explain what these REMs are, millirungans, at which levels they pose a real threat to human health, at which level they don't, how to behave in conditions with increased radiation levels. This, as far as I can remember, was the only article that had a helpful, calming effect on others. But the number of such articles could certainly have been way higher. It seems to me that they were overly modest and careful when writing about what happened at the station itself, why the accident occurred, whose fault it was, whether the reactor was defective, or the actions of the staff were wrong. Of course, much has been written about this, and I myself was involved in describing the events that preceded the accident. But in reality, I think that the full picture of exactly what happened and how is not entirely clear to anyone. Overall, this extraordinary and tragic event, a difficult situation of immense magnitude, has shown that it requires not only the mobilization of considerable communication resources, but also a very creative and skillful use of these resources to ensure that the population receives information in the needed sequence and quantity who can refer to the information with complete confidence and most importantly be able to use this information for practical purposes or to indicate when to worry and conversely when to stay calm so that is quite regular and not sudden. Altogether, these were extremely important questions. Sometimes I even think that an event of such magnitude could have had a special television, a newspaper section consisting of two parts. The Chernobyl part of this section would be exclusively official to provide the precise information from the government commission at the time when this section is released, and the second part should be an emotional part narrative with personal opinions. This, altogether, is a serious question about how to and to what extent cover such large, very unpleasant and difficult events 
that affect and alarm almost the entire country's population, and not only. Since I have touched upon communications a little, it may be the right time to express some personal opinions about how on earth I got involved with this story, how I was convinced to it, how I understood the history and quality of the development of nuclear energy, and how I understand it now. Rarely have any of us really spoken frankly and accurately about this. I graduated from the Faculty of Physiochemical Engineering of the Moscow Institute of Chemistry and Technology, named after Mendeleev. This faculty trained specialists, mainly researchers, who were then supposed to work in the field of nuclear industry, that is being able to separate isotopes, to work with radioactive substances, to extract uranium from the ore, bring it to the needed condition, make nuclear fuel from it, to process nuclear fuel that had been removed from the reactor, having a strong radioactivity component, to extract useful products from it, as well as the dangerous and hazardous parts, to be able to compact them, bury them, so that they would not harm humans, and use parts of radioactive resources for the national economy, medicine maybe. This is a group of specific subjects I was trained on. Then, I graduated from the Khrushchev Institute in the field of nuclear fuel processing. Academician Kikoyev tried to convince me to continue with postgraduate studies because he lacked my graduation thesis. But my comrades and I agreed to work for a while at one of the nuclear plants to get some practical skills in the field that would later become the subject of our research. I was sort of the proponent of this idea, and so I couldn't accept the offer of postgraduate studies and left for Tomsk. I got into one of our closed cities, where I participated in launching one of the radiochemical plants. That was very interesting. The exciting time when a young man begins practice. I worked at this plant for about two years. And then I was pulled out, with the permission of the Communist Party, for my postgraduate studies at the same Khrushchev Institute. I have to mention that I was already a Communist Party member since the beginning of my time at the Institute. With the encouragement of my friend and comrade, Vladimir Dmitrievich Klimov, who worked there, I passed the candidate exams at the Tomsk Polytechnic Institute and left after passing the exams to work on my candidate thesis. My first PhD thesis was proposed to me and was about tackling the problem of a gas phase reactor that would contain gaseous uranium hexachloride as a fuel and such problems, namely the problem of interaction at high temperatures of uranium hexachloride with construction materials. These were the problems that I was researching. After obtaining a lot of data, I wrote a large report that could have been the basis for my dissertation, or maybe it already was a complete dissertation. But at this time, my comrade postgraduate Viktor Konstantinovich Popov informed me that in Canada, Professor Bartlett had done excellent staggering chemist work on obtaining a true xenon compound, one of the noble gases. This information captured my imagination, and I devoted all my subsequent professional work to synthesizing such unusual compounds using various physical methods that would be powerful oxidizing agents that have a number of unusual properties which I was happy to work on and on the basis on which it was possible to build a whole range of technological processes. And this is how my professional work was progressing, which gave me the ability to successively defend the candidate thesis, the doctoral thesis, dissertations. Later, with the development of these works, they were evaluated and they all led to me being elected into the Academy of Sciences. The research part of the work was awarded the USSR State Prize. The applied part 
was awarded the Lenin Prize. So this was my own professional work, to which I managed to attract the most interesting young people, who with good education and understanding are still developing the extremely interesting area of chemical physics, from which I'm sure will originate very many developments important for practice and for education.